Welcome back to Robot Cantina. I have to be honest, I finally got a haircut and shave, and my neighbor mowed my lawn out of desperation. So, at the very least, I'm going to look nice for this episode. Now, we have a lot to show you this time, so get the bagels out of the toaster before they burn, and here's a pro tip. You can never have too much cream cheese. As we pursue our goal to go 70 miles per hour in a supercharged fuel-injected 420cc powered street legal go-kart, we encounter many challenges. Some can be solved easily and others take time. Today, before we head out to the Hillbilly Proving Grounds, we'll attempt to resolve the high vacuum in the supercharger and outfit our car with a big boy methanol injection system. And with this project, there are no easy solutions. With that said, let's see what we can get ourselves into. So the throttle body we were using was just something we found on eBay. It's a decent throttle body, but a bit small. One of the viewers in a previous supercharger video was able to identify what motorcycle the throttle body originally came from, and thank you for that. After a quick search on the internet, I was able to locate the throttle body, and as a bonus, I found a larger throttle body. The one that we were using was a 30 millimeter, and the new one is 34 millimeter, so right away we're making progress. As it turns out, this throttle body was sourced from Go Power Sports in Texas. Now keep in mind, I'm not affiliated with Go Power Sports, but I thought I would mention them because apparently they have a bunch of parts for tiny fuel injection systems. So if that's your thing, check it out. The first problem we're going to tackle today is the massive amount of vacuum we're seeing inside the supercharger at idle and when lifting the accelerator pedal. You see, the supercharger we're using was not designed for this much vacuum and the internal seals are allowing the supercharger oil to leak into the induction system. The oil leaking into the induction system ain't going to hurt the engine. The problem is, it's draining the oil supply that we need to keep the supercharger lubricated. So what we really need is a bypass valve in the supercharger to avoid this problem. So a bypass system is incredibly hard to implement on such a small scale. And keep in mind, everything about this project is tiny. So a common solution used to solve problems like ours is to go with a double throttle body system. So the double throttle bodies present a problem in how we're going to control them. There's a number of ways to do this, but the cheapest and simplest way to do it is to 3D print some sort of throttle cable splitter gizmo doohickey, or something like that. We told the 3D printer what we wanted, and it spit out something a few hours later. Oh, and we need one of these thingies too. So let's have a look. Now, mind you, these are prototypes and they were printed in PLA plastic. This is what I'm calling the slider, and it's what connects all the cables together. The slider fits inside the slider enclosure, and, well, it slides. It slides pretty good, so that's a win. Now the single hole on this side is for the accelerator pedal cable, and the two holes on the other side are for the dual throttle bodies. Now I screwed up, and I made the holes for the adjustment thingies too big, so that's a strike for Jimbo, but keep in mind it's a prototype. The assorted cables get locked into the slider by using these cable barrel type clamps that I got from the jungle site with next day delivery. Not my first choice, but they do seem to work pretty good. This last part is of course the cover. Now fortunately I had the forethought to put slots in the cover to provide clearance. Kinda looks like I know what I'm doing. Anyway, it all fits together and the slider actually slides. Let's test it out. Alright, so here we have the throttle cable splitter thingy sort of connected. On this side we can see where the accelerator pedal cable attaches, and on this side we can see where one of the two throttle body cables goes. And that cable will go to this throttle body. For this quick test we won't be connecting the other throttle body, because at this point it isn't necessary. Now as you can see everything's kind of wobbly, and we definitely need to print an updated version. But before I do that, I want to verify that there's enough space to allow the slider to move enough to provide wide open throttle when called on. Now for this simple test, all I'm going to do is slide the slider forward and check the throttle body to see if the throttle is maxed out. Yep, it looks like this will work. Let's make a real one. So I ain't never learned to do CAD, but that's not really a problem. You see, there's a totally free resource on the internet called Tinkercad, and that's where I do all my design stuff. Now, this isn't a traditional CAD package. It's a much simplified type of CAD, and it's actually easy to learn. The throttle splitter thingy that we just looked at was developed using this Tinkercad. Now, I'm not going to give you a lesson on how I built the throttle splitter, but I will give you a 10 second demo. So Tinkercad works by adding and subtracting basic shapes. It may sound too simple to do complex designs, but I assure you, I've seen masterpieces come from Tinkercad. So now we have a block, let's add an empty space to it to form a cavity. To do that, we select a non-solid object, stretch and pull it into shape, of course, you can also just type in the dimensions. 
Once you have everything the way you want it, just select the whole part and click on the group icon. And voila, now you have a useless block with a hole in it. Meh, you get the idea. And like I said, this is a free resource. There's plenty of tutorials on YouTube on how to get started if you want to give it a try. Okay, so this time around we have the final design printed. Now we used ASA plastic with 100% infill on this design because we need it to be strong and it needs to be able to tolerate the temperatures under the hood. The PLA plastic that we previously used probably wouldn't last very long, but this ASA is tough stuff, and of course they make tougher plastics if ASA isn't up to the job. So for the adjustment thingies, this time I printed the splitter box with slightly undersized holes, and now we can tap the holes to 6mm with a conventional tap using conventional techniques. Now it's tempting to chuck the tap into a drill and zip the threads in, but keep in mind this is plastic and that sort of friction would cause too much heat. I guess I should also mention that we have a very good 3D printer with a full enclosure. Parts like this that are printed in ASA or ABS need to have a draft-free environment to print correctly. The cheaper open-air 3D printers are great to learn on, but the parts are prone to warping if the room temperature changes. Of course, all your questions can be answered by a Google search and some YouTube videos whenever you get into trouble. Anyway, this thing came out really nice. I actually thought about putting a Honda logo on it so it would look OEM because everybody knows Honda makes good stuff. Did I just say that? Boy, I need a break. So normally when an engine's running, it draws in air, and typically the temperature of the air is a little bit above ambient. Now when you add a supercharger to the picture, well, now you're going to see some big temperature changes. You see the supercharger is a compressor, and as it compresses the air, it also heats it up quite a bit. Anyway, heating up the air has a negative effect on making power, and it can also cause engine damage. At some point, the hot induction air can cause spontaneous detonation, and what that means is, the air fuel charge ignites before the ignition shoots a jolt of electricity to the spark plug. Detonation is a serious event, and when it happens, the engine only has moments before the piston melts, or worse. A way to combat the high temperatures in the induction system is to inject a mixture of methanol and water. Now in my little cartoon, I show the meth being injected into the stupid charger, and that's both okay and preferred. The thing you can't do is to inject the meth directly into a turbo. Oof, that'll destroy it. So in today's meth lab, we're going to scale down a 300 horsepower meth injection kit to work with a cement mixer engine. Here we have a meth tank, a high pressure pump, a boost sensor, and a control relay. It's all very simple stuff, but not for long. Let's fill the tank with boost juice and start fooling around. Now, full disclosure, I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing. Right away we have a problem. You see this boost sensor is set to go off at 130 kilopascals, and when it sees that pressure, it'll flip a low current switch, and in turn, that'll trigger the high current pump relay, and the process will begin. Meh, in our bench setup, we don't have boost to trigger the sensor, so we're going to have to bypass the sensor with this little switch. Yep, I reckon it works, but that amount of boost juice would hydrolock most engines, so now we need to install a misting nozzle. The nozzle we're going to use is a number 3, and I would have preferred a number 1, but they're unattainable at the moment. So let's work with what we got. That's much better. Now according to my research, you need at least 60 PSI to fully atomize the boost juice. Now right now we're shooting at 200 PSI. Let's see how much juice this system can provide in one minute. Now we're set up to measure the flow rate, and I'm guessing it's going to be way too much, but let's get a good starting point. As you can see, I added a cheapo pressure gauge to the system. It's rated for the pressure we're running, but not necessarily the best money can buy. Let's see how much stuff we've pumped out in one minute. Well, it looks like we got 200 milliliters, and that may be way too much. I'm not sure how much meth we need, but that seems an awful lot. Okay, so we're back, and I got some explaining to do. So this time around, we're going to run a bypass system to reduce both the flow and the pressure. The new pressure we're going to try is 60 PSI, and the bypass system will return most of the methanol back to the tank. Let's see how this works. Okay. 
Not too bad. We're still getting animization at 60 PSI, so that's a plus. Now let's find out the flow rate. So it looks like we cut down the flow by half, and now we're pumping 100 milliliters per minute. That may still be too much, but I have a few tricks we'll get to later. For now, let's do some different experiments. Okay, so here I'm using a shop vac backwards, and instead of sucking, it'll blow through the section of induction piping. So a big flaw in a plan. Let's take a better look. When we sprayed the atomized meth into this tiny pipe, well, it immediately turned back into a liquid, and that ain't gonna work. I guess we need something different in order to keep the meth atomized. Something different. Hmm, I wonder. Yeah, let's try it. So what we got here is a meth bazooka. Yep, because why not? This project needs another thing to add to the already long list of things. The bazooka fits on the throttle body that's ahead of the supercharger and should keep the meth atomized as we inject it. Let's do another experiment. So this time around we have the shop vac sucking in the air and the meth. So let's have a look. Oh, and Mythbusters proved this sort of setup won't explode. Or was it something else? Well, whatever. So naturally things got a lot more complicated when we fine-tuned the system. You folks may recognize the pump and the holding tank, but we got a little bit more creative. Over here we have a PWM motor controller to slow down the pump. This controller cost 17 bucks on the jungle site and worked perfectly right out of the box. Now this crazy thing, well, <laughs> did I mention we got creative? Let's have a closer look. So this thing is effectively a frequency valve and it turns our meth injection system into a pulsed injection system. So we used all kinds of stuff to make this. Over here we have an adjustable hyper turn signal flasher unit that pulses a standard cube relay and in turn that opens and closes the reverse osmosis valve. Oh, and it's all mounted on a custom 3D printed doohickey. Not too shabby. Let's see what happens when we activate the system. So at the slowest speed we got about 70 milliliters per minute. No idea if that's too much or not enough. Science is all about trying to understand what can't be understood, or something like that. I really don't know. So let's see if the car will even run. It's been a while. So first off, you can see the induction pipes didn't collapse, and yeah, we took out the reinforcement tubes we installed in the previous episode. With the double throttle bodies, all the vacuum is behind this throttle body, and that's completely normal. We have the system set up to allow the supercharger to provide a tiny bit of positive pressure to the induction pipes at idle. So overall, the twin throttle bodies work as expected. Now for the meth injection system, well, I reckon we'll need to head out to the Hillbilly Proving Grounds. So this week in Kansas, it's suddenly hot. I reckon it's in the 90s. And before we can take the car out for some testing, we went ahead and rigged up some hood spacers to allow some additional airflow under the hood. These spacers are rubber and are a bit janky, but they do the trick as far as holding the hood in place. Let's take this thing for a ride and collect some data. So this time around the car is struggling and we'll need to do some tuning. Big surprise. Of course the cameraman had to show off and prove that a Toyota minivan is faster than a cement mixer powered Honda Insight. If you squint you can still see the Honda. Whoops now it's gone. Great camera work buddy. Eventually I did manage to catch up. The first part of the day we spent dialing in the tune. Setting up the tune to work with the meth took longer than expected. Whenever the meth system got triggered, the engine would stumble for a few seconds and then rev up. I didn't notice any increase in power though. As an experiment, 
I engaged the auto-tune feature to help adjust VE numbers when the meth system was active. Oddly enough, it helped. With so much going on, the tune was more or less dialed in without data logging, and the edits were made on the fly. It's almost impossible to hear, but the meth injector alarm is constantly blasting, indicating the meth injection is active. Then at some point, I noticed the meth system wouldn't even trigger anymore, so I pulled over for a pit stop to have a look. So as you may recall, the meth system is triggered when it sees boost above 130 kilopascals, which is pretty much all the time. And when it stopped working, well, the obvious reason was we somehow lost boost. It only took a moment to spot the problem. One of the bolts had somehow managed to escape, and we no longer had a sealed induction system. Now because the car has double throttle bodies, the engine still ran, but more or less without boost. Well, crap. The good news is the car was able to make it back to the shop on its own power. The fix only took a few minutes, but before we went back out to the hillbilly proving grounds, we decided to take the hood off. Because by this time in the day, the sun was blazing. The decision was made to postpone tuning with the meth injection. And the reason is, on this engine, the meth is more or less a band-aid. And what we really need is an intercooler to get the charge temperatures under control at idle and part throttle. Otherwise, the meth injection would be on all the time. And that's a ridiculous concept, even for this channel. Anyway, we went back out and did some more tuning. Yeah, the intake temperature got to insane levels, but the engine still ran and we didn't experience any detonation. So unfortunately we don't have any good data with the meth injection, but we do have a full send without the meth, just to see how bad things got. Now this time around we're going to start off in second gear, because even with the supercharger, we're down on power because the IATs are hovering around 200 degrees Fahrenheit at idle. So I do get a lot of questions on why we normally start off in third gear. I reckon that makes no sense to new viewers. You see, we start off in third gear, then shift to fourth and eventually to fifth. We never use first and rarely use second. I get it, that makes no sense. So here's the deal. Likely the reason you're watching this video series is the fact that the car has a rather small 420cc engine that can be found on cement mixers or even go-karts. So what we did was mate the little engine to a 5-speed Honda Inside transmission or gearbox. Now we are using a go-kart type torque converter clutch. Unfortunately in this picture the belt's missing in action, but I assure you we use a belt. Anyway, we also use an additional ratio multiplier in the form of a chain drive reduction. This chain drive reduction system is how we tune the drive system to launch a 1300 pound go-kart with a tiny 420 cc engine. It's all in the math, so don't forget to learn your ABCs when you're in school or something like that. So what we ended up with is a compound transmission system that sort of works like an automatic transmission up to 50 miles per hour. After 50 miles an hour, then we need to shift gears like a manual transmission. The beauty of the system is the go-kart torque converter clutch is actually a CVT or continuously variable transmission. When we select third gear to start off in, we're actually starting off in first gear because of the CVT clutch system. And because of the CVT has infinite ratios, theoretically the transmission is constantly shifting an infinite amount of times, all the way up to 50 miles per hour. So technically we have over a billion gear changes. Well, it's actually infinitely more than a billion trillion gear changes, all the way up to 50. Imagine trying to shift the transmission a zillion times in the first 30 or so seconds. Yeah, that would be difficult. So I have to admit, yeah, the torque converter clutch ain't set up perfectly yet, and we're working on that. But that's a topic for a future video. We've been on the quest to build the fastest lawnmower powered car for well over two years. And we have many videos explaining all the hurdles we had to jump. Just click on the Robot Cantina channel and then videos. It's an insane journey. So if this sort of crazy appeals to you, by all means watch the past videos and of course subscribe to see more. Now let's get back to the road test. So like I said, this time we're going to start off in second gear and not the normal third gear. I reckon we're pushing our luck, but I want you folks to see what we're dealing with. 
So keep in mind the hood is off the car and we have plenty of airflow around the engine and the supercharger. Yet the intake air temperatures will hover around 200 degrees Fahrenheit at idle. We really need to have some reasonable temperatures before we can get the meth system to work correctly. Because right now we can't even launch the car properly. I'm sure the meth would help once we got the car rolling, but don't forget this is only a 420cc engine and with the elevated IAT temperatures we lose a whole lot of power before we even start. Anyway, let's just send it and hope for the best. So once we hit 64 miles an hour, we shifted into fifth gear and went for it. But at this point, we were pretty much losing more power than we were making, if that makes any sense. The little engine just couldn't pull any harder because it was pretty much breathing fire. Poor thing. Even with everything going against it, the little car managed to get up to 64 miles per hour, which is one mile per hour less than our all-time record. Not too bad. I ended up pulling over and we let the car idle for over 5 minutes to give it a chance to cool down. Well, the engine really never got too hot and the block temperature maxed out at 250 degrees Fahrenheit and for an air cooled engine that's fine. The cylinder head temp maxed out at 317 degrees Fahrenheit and that's a little bit hotter than normal but evidently the engine can shrug that off. Oh yeah, let's not forget this is a thin-walled aluminum air-cooled engine. It's hella noisy even on its good days. It bangs, farts, and clicks like it's no thing. Sometimes it sounds like a diesel garbage truck going up a hill, but that's the nature of the beast. When we send it, I'm acutely aware of all the sounds and I'm ready to kill the engine if I hear something alarming. The sounds that you hear on the video are normal for this engine. We pushed it hard, but backed off before anything bad happened. So for the folks who think the engine's knocking or detonating, well, keep in mind this is a crappy little engine and this is how it sounds normally. So what did we prove today? What with the meth injection not fully tested and the intake air temperature still a problem? Well, baby steps. The twin throttle bodies worked and we were able to keep the supercharger from experiencing vacuum and that's a big deal. You see previously the high vacuum in the supercharger was sucking the oil right out of the supercharger. Now I do have some concerns about the oil we're using. You see the crappy and virtually non-existent documentation indicated that the supercharger should be filled with 8090 gear lube. I suspect the gear lube may be causing the supercharger to run hot. I've seen this problem before on certain transmissions. The good news is we have synthetic supercharger oil on its way and we'll do an experiment as soon as it arrives. So the path to the 70 mile per hour goal is clearer than ever. 
The twin throttle body meth bazooka injected supercharged fuel injected 420cc hemi from a cement mixer powering our street legal go-kart needs an intercooler. So that would make it... <laughs> <laughs> that would make it an intercooled twin throttle body meth bazooka injected supercharged fuel injected 420 cc hemi from a cement mixer Woo, that's quite a list and we'll add to it if necessary but i'm not sure what else we could do